So you already know that Nandan was born in Dharwad and Rohini is a Mumbaiker, all that stuff, right? How, if you really want to help these people who are living on $2, $4 a day, we have to co-create the solution with the people who need it, and then also build the capacity within that community to spread the solution, right? So co-creation and building capacity has been the mantra for the sandbox. That's the sort of the core idea behind the sandbox. And we have now done it for 10 years. And, and you know, we have that big campus, we have incubation center, we have this place, we have 700 people on the payroll under Naveen Shah's le leadership. So it, it's, it's scaled quite a bit. But now we need to get to another few more orders of magnitude to actually have an impact in the world. So we started off by saying we need systems thinking. But what is the right API between people who actually work you know, hands-on in villages and people who need the help, and the big thinkers who, who do thinking. And, and there's a lot that needs to happen before we can actually make it all work. And, and so we have two people here uh, who actually have deep knowledge in both of those. You know, Nandan is very much a systems guy. Um, you know, he, he did Aadhaar, and now he'll tell us a little bit more about what he's working on in terms of coming up with technology platform that can make a huge difference. And Rohini, throughout her career, has been pretty bottoms up. I mean, she's worked with lots of villages and people and, and, and really made a lot of things happen. So, so let's see if they can come together and agree on what is the right API. So, so Nandan, why don't you tell us a little bit about your technology platform and what are you thinking? Well, uh this actually came out of the work that we have done separately, and uh, you know, even Rohini has worked a lot on platforms. Uh, the, what the work she has done on Pratham Books is reaching millions of books. Uh, millions of kids are getting books in many, many languages. It's an open platform that. She, so both of us have come from that thinking. So uh, we came to this when uh, we it actually it happened in Boston, your your town, at MIT, uh, because. Uh, after I lost my election, I was jobless, no job in politics, so I was generally jobless. And uh, our son-in-law was graduating from Harvard Business School, so we had come for the graduation. And uh, Rohini and I went to meet uh, Anand Agarwal and uh, uh, Sanjay Sarma at the edX, the university, MOOC set up by Harvard and MIT. And uh, Rohini had spent many, many years in primary education. She had looked at uh, through Pratham and Akshara and many organizations. So as we were looking at uh, the edX platform, Rohini said, OK, this is all fine for all these guys who want to learn AI or machine learning and all that. But what about small kids, where there's such a huge learning problem? Can, can we create a, like a MOOC for small kids? So I asked her, what's the size of the problem? She said, 200 million kids. I said, that sounds decent because... That was the only way to get him involved. A minimum number of 200 million, I thought, can get him excited. Because my, after having done Aadhaar, I was a bit spoiled. I said, unless I can do something for a billion people, there's no fun. So 200 million was good enough. So that's how we got into our focus on uh, education. And initially, we thought uh, we should build a platform where we would provide gamified content on smartphones to kids, which is where the, a lot of the US research was on gamification and so on. But really, we realized it's not a content problem. It's really how do you create the right infrastructure for being able to co-create content of different kinds for different people. So we sort of pivoted a couple of times. And out of that experience came what we call as societal platform. So maybe I'll, in a nutshell, I'll try to explain what that is. I, I, our thinking is that. You, we can't solve a problem like education and even health by saying this is our solution. Because solutions are, cannot be one size fits all. Every context is different. In education, the language is different, the course is different, the, the environment is different, the, everything is different. So rather than giving solutions, what we need is to create infrastructure which allows others to create solutions on it. And that's the, the co-creation aspect. So that's what we're thinking about, that you need to co-create, uh, have the ability to co-create solutions. And then the, the delivery of that is an amplification. So you can deliver that through schools, private schools, public schools, through tuition teachers. That's all amplification. But and to, underlie, 
to make all this happen, you need a very, very profound digital infrastructure. So broadly, the way we think about this is that there is a co-creation layer which allows you to create solutions built on top of a very strong digital infrastructure and with amplification partners who take it forward. And uh, so that's briefly what it is. Maybe I'll ask Rohini to continue on that. Yeah, because uh, see, after many, many years of the Indian very strong NGO sector and tremendous government backing, we are still in a situation where young children in this country are not learning basics. And that's a national tragedy, and there are many reasons for it. And so uh, what uh, we wanted to draw from our common experiences Nandan's ability to think at very large scale architectures that are uh, system-wide and from my uh, experience of the civil society sector which is able to use passion, commitment, integrity to scale but to scale people's capacity, not necessarily a cookie cutter solution but to scale the ability of people everywhere to contextually become a part of their own solutions. And we brought these two ideas together in this concept called societal platform, because we believe that neither Samaj, Bazaar, nor Sarkar alone can solve any of the very complex problems in India and around the world. And unless all these three entities are able to come together on a shared, elegant, and necessarily digital infrastructure, which I learned from Nandan, um, we cannot really allow each of these sectors to do what they do best. And so we Extep Learning Foundation is where we have developed this idea of societal platforms. And um, Nandan will also talk more, especially on the design of an elegant shared infrastructure, which is a technological platform. But the front end is easy for everybody to use. Back end is highly sophisticated and needs philanthropic capital to be invested in, in it. But I think it holds the possibility for uh, a, uni, uh, a very unified common structure without imposing uniform solutions. And I think you all are trying to do that here. So it's really an abstraction of your model itself. Yeah, yeah. So how, how far have you come with this platform? Where is that? Yeah, so I think for, there are two things. One is uh, the education stuff is an instantiation of this idea. So there is a societal platform abstract concept. And the education is one instance of this. So currently, uh, there are three or four groups looking at using this, infra this concept for healthcare, okay. livelihoods, and all. So that's one aspect. On the education instant itself, I think we have come a long way. and. Uh, we now have the pretty much a lot of the infrastructure in place. Uh, it's an open source Creative Commons uh, platform, so anybody can use it. It's, it's on GitHub, so people can just download and start using it. And uh, we're working with uh, NGO partners who are taking it out. We're working with the government. Uh, just l this week, the, uh, in the budget speech, uh, you know, the finance minister talked about technology and learning and going from blackboards to digital uh, technology, and he mentioned a program called Diksha. And uh, the Diksha underlying technology actually is, some of it is using the, what, what, the open source that is there. And, uh, uh, and also, we're working with four states uh, to do what we call as energizing textbooks. Because what, what we found was happening was that there was a classical education model which was textbooks. And there's all this newfangled digital stuff, but the two were not connected, they were like parallel things. Uh, so what we have done is that we have now designed an architecture which essentially uh, puts in QR codes in textbooks by topic, and there's a whole addressing system for that. So then anybody with a smartphone can just point to the QR code on, say, solar system, and the digital content on solar system will come up. And that could be regular content, it could be a test, it could be augmented reality, it doesn't matter. So this is a way of linking the physical world of textbooks with the digital world. So, so this is getting rolled out now in four states with, you know. Actually, just imagine how powerful an idea that is, okay? In most homes of this country, because 99% of our children are actually enrolled. So whether they attend or whether they learn is a separate question. So they have access to school. And the one book you will find in every home of this country, even in a thatched hut, is one textbook. Now, the technology the team has come up with is a simple thing. You put a QR code on this, in this textbook. And automatically, 
when you can scan it, and we could, I wish we had brought some videos, but if the child can scan that, it gives, it puts her onto a virtual highway, where what you put there, of course, matters, and how she receives it matters. But you instantly have in every home, for every child, the option to bypass age-old systems and leapfrog into digital technology. It's important to do it right, so the philosophical call we come from is very critical, but just imagine the potential of this. Uh, can I give the example of the three layers uh, of sure. the societal platform? So um, we, know, we know that people are trying all sorts of things, but what we thought is why are things not scaling up to the population level like Aadhaar does, did? And so the team, the tech team, the best of talent in the world, Nandan has called into this uh, uh, effort that we are all uh, doing together. And so we started to say let's abstract out the context independent elements and see what we can build for that. So for example, in education, we all know there has to be a learner and a teacher and both need content. So content is the abstracted idea, right? It's the common denominator for all learning. So then the team developed content creation tools and all sorts of other assets which are technology heavy, so if I try to explain them, you'll get more confused. Uh, but lots of tools in that infrastructure layer. In the second layer, people were able to be more context aware and use these context independent tools, for example, to build math content, like math worksheets or math problems or math assessment in that second layer. And then in the third layer where you're actually deploying, where you want the amplification to happen, that's when real context specificity comes in. And to be able to address the vast diversity of India, in the third layer, somebody can pick up those math worksheets and make them even more specific to content. It could be in Tamil, it could be for third grade math, it could be for 10th grade math. So you see what I'm saying. There's a common shared infrastructure of how a content creation tool on top of it, a math content creation tool is created. On top of it, a Tamil third grade math content tool is created for using and deployed through various partners who are seamlessly able to come on the platform. Well, when, when is the first time that you'll actually have something that you can show people? Well, I think, uh, uh, I think if, uh, well, it was showing you shirt now, but we didn't, we didn't bring anything to show. No, no, no. no I, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. actually having used it so, so, and so, showing so, the impact. No, an example of that will be, I think, by uh, the academic year starting this year. Uh, in four states, you will have millions of textbooks which are QR coded, and there'll be digital content accessible on that. The initial digital content will be the minimum viable product kind of stuff. but. The important thing is the architecture has unbundled the digital content from the physical. So over time, people will build better and better digital content, and they'll just connect using the same addressing technology. So you'll see the first massive rollout in four states in six months. Uh, what, which, which are the four states? Uh, the states are uh, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra, and Rajasthan. OK. So can we schedule a demo of it for next DD? Sure, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah oh, yeah. Course. Okay. Uh, so imagine there's this national teacher platform called Diksha, which has been created off of this uh, open shared platform on which teachers are learning to create digital content, which is different from just physical content because there is a ped new pedagogy emerging there. So the national teachers program, which is a full scale rollout across all states, will have lots of teachers, and the best teachers will rise to the top, the best content will rise to the top. Others will be able to learn and develop local content from those best practices so you're slowly building up a machine which is uh, human interested caring adults developing good content for children from this side and on this side you have the QR codes uh, architecture being built to link the content to every single child and every single textbook so it's like you'll suddenly see that hockey stick effect and from it's what not, they and have it's designed. not just schools uh, the 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 application is side loadable, so what can happen is that a teacher can start using it in a school and then the teacher can get the parents to side load it from their smartphone to the, the ch parents' smartphone. So the parent can then in, at home use the same content for test, for, for example, for uh, homework or, or for practice and so on. So there are a lot of other adjacencies that are there. And the whole open source infrastructure is designed, for example, it can be used for skills tomorrow or for higher ed tomorrow. So it's really a set of reusable objects. So in terms of, you know, within the audience here, we have some very techies, 
some people who are technical but also understand the actual process of teaching and everything else. And then we have some people who just are into teaching. What's, the, what's your guess on the maturity of this platform as to when they should start getting involved with this platform? Well, I think obviously if it's for people who are at the cutting edge of delivering teaching and amplification, they'll need ready-made stuff to use. So that depends on that. But certainly for the middle layer, uh, people who want to co-create, uh, they can start using it now. We have, for example, uh, today we have a partnership with uh, Shubhalal's foundation. And he's using this to create school leadership platform. But underlying is the same content. Uh, we're working with a group in, in the in, in uh, New Mexico, which is looking at telementoring on healthcare. So they're going to build on that. So there are lots of people now looking at taking this. and So that part is doable. And the tech, of course, they can contribute. It's an open source project. And uh, you know, anybody can contribute. Yeah, in fact, we hope they will contribute to the platform to make it richer. Uh, Desh, I hope you're going to have some interactivity yeah. uh, instead of just listening to maybe an overdose of Nilekanis otherwise. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so why don't we open up the floor so that we can take questions. And it doesn't have to be just on the technology platform. Uh, it can be a discussion on anything in terms of how do we bring systems thinking to this bottom-up approach of uh, building capability within the field and creating the right solutions. So, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, Nandan. Uh, this is uh, Veer Narayan Kulkarni here. Uh, Nandan, uh, I've been very inquisitive of when you started Aadhaar in 2009, and it's been almost nine years. The scale to which it has uh, reached is tremendous, unseen in India till now. Uh, there have been some challenges that you have gone through. I have read it, but then I, I want to know what has made you to persevere through this journey. As an entrepreneur, I would like to listen it from you firsthand. Well, uh, I think, uh, first of all, uh, when, when we started it, the intent was to reach everyone. So we had to reach a billion, 1.3 billion people. So that was the goal. And uh, also, it had to be something that scaled up very quickly. Because uh, uh, unless you can scale it up, then you don't, you don't have momentum. Momentum only comes from rapid scaling. Or other way around, you know, scaling comes from rapid momentum. So you need to get momentum, which meant you have to be simple in design. So I mean, obviously, in the journey, we had many, many twists and turns. And uh, uh, you know, it had to go through uh, different filters of opposition. Uh, so I think, yes, you know, I, we have to navigate that. Of course, I'm no longer involved with it, at least of, you know, in the sense I re resigned from the government in March 2014. And since then, there's been a new government which has taken it forward. So, but I think the fundamental value keeps it going. I mean, you know, from the government perspective, one, it helps in reducing fraud and wastage in government programs. and. Uh, that itself is a justification for the government because they save thousands of crores, billions of dollars. And second, it solves an inclusion issue. People who didn't have an ID now have a nationally portable ID. They can use that to get a bank account or to get a mobile connection. So there's enough value for the government, there's enough value for people. So there's enough sort of value in it for it to, I think, survive any change in a political scenario or so on. So the fact that it survived the change in government shows the strength of the core idea. So and then, well, what's the relative size of effort for Aadhaar versus the societal platform? Well, Aadhaar was a government project. So yeah, I when I did the project, I was an employee of the government. And therefore, we had the government resources behind it. And uh, uh, we had great talent, both from within the government as well as people from the tech world who made a role. And the total spending on Aadhaar was about 9,000 crores, about 1.5 billion US dollars to come to where it is. Uh, so when you have the government, obviously, you have the government's uh, uh, you know, strength to get things done. When you're creating a societal platform, you're doing it as a philanthropy, NGO kind of thing. So you have to entirely work on your, again, on the strength of your ideas to convince whether it's governments or private or NGOs to become partners. So the do, do you see the societal platform becoming a, a government platform? No, well, I mean, the government is obviously a huge player. Uh, but the way we think about societal platforms is that 
uh, it's about bringing together, as Roni said, bringing together the uh, Samaj, which is society, uh, Sarkar, which is government, and, uh, and, and, and markets all together. And therefore, one of the things that at least I've learned is that government is, is a great amplifier. And if you can contribute to the design architecture of the solution early in its life cycle, then the amplification is very uh, powerful. So design, design thinking and design architecture at the inception is very important. So a lot of the effort that I do with government is about making, contributing to the design architecture and so on, so that once the amplification starts, then the, nothing just happens. If the, if the design is, is not thought through, then amplification f fails. So I think having a seat at the table at the point of design is very important. Hi, I'm Abhinav. I came five years ago to a development dialogue and got so so inclined towards the social sector. I worked with Naveen to actually set up the Varanasi sandbox. I helped there. And then subsequently, I quit my uh, corporate career of 24 years and set up Million Sparks Foundation. The question is, uh, you know, I'll, I'll come to the question, but you know, what we do is we have set up Million Sparks Foundation, which has created a mobile platform called Chocolate which very similar to you, uh, is a teacher capacity building platform. And we work with the states of Delhi, Goa, Haryana, and Uttar Pradesh, impacting close to a million teachers now, uh, where we basically help them train themselves. So the thing is that the ambition, of course, is to touch 15 million teachers. Now, the kind of resources that are required, and you know, I'm sure that there will be a, a commonality and we'll use your platform. That kind of resources, how does one get to those kind of resources and how does one partner with philanthropic organizations like yourself to collaborate and to create resources for making that audacious kind of a goal met? Well, I, frankly, I don't think it's a resource issue in the sense, you know, in the last 18 years since the Sarva Siksha Abhiyan was launched, uh, government public spending on education has just grown. I mean. The central government budget for education is 80,000 crores. That's about you know, 13 to 14 billion US dollars. So it's a lot of money is being spent. And today when you look at major philanthropists, all major philanthropists have education as a big vertical where they, where they invest money. So pri private philanthropic capital is there, government capital is there. It's just a question of aligning everything so that people put money behind the same set of initiatives. So I have capital from I have capital from Central Square Foundation and I have capital from Paytm, but that is still very, very minuscule in comparison to what is required. And the second thing is that the government capital, the moment you go to the government and ask for money, they get into this tendering process and they no, have I, I don't so think I don't think it's about selling it to government or asking government to give money. It's about making it part of government's program to reach them. If the government is going to reach to one million teachers, and if they believe that your platform is the way to reach one million, then they'll just take it. So it's not about selling it to them, it's about making them adopt your approach. Yeah, you need not draw government capital into your books. You have to leverage how that capital works, where it's working. And um, uh, in terms of what the platform we are building, uh, we really hope that you will be able to use this platform to amplify your work and contribute back to the platform. So it's, I think, less than a year away that you will be able to put chocolate onto this platform. And it, we are not saying it's our platform. It's a public good platform. So uh, you can use it in the same way that you use Google, I hope. My name is Dwarka Pandurangi. I am on the board of an NGO called Vidya Sagar, Spastic Society of India. I've come here to explore how uh, anyone can collaborate, how we can ever think of disability in, in terms of a, anything other than a non-profit alone. So, uh, but uh, the I, uh, question to you from me is about, you know, when we were in Delhi, I have taught eight children, you know, of, uh, children of uh, house help and watchmen and things like that. And all of them have either graduated or are doing their graduation now. We put them into government schools, uh, anyway, sorry, private schools from government schools because, you know, they, nothing happened in government schools. They learned nothing 
from um, alphabets to everything we taught them and then got them to pass the tests and everything. My question to you is, as thought leaders, in, um, apart from providing the, the tools for people to make lessons uh, for uh, students, would you also be looking at content? Because I found that the content was absolutely absurd in some cases, you know. The English lessons, for a fourth kid who can't even answer what is your name, you know, the first lesson in the English textbook said sharing our earth, and it says, unbeknownst to us, several insects yeah. help in pollination. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, would you be looking at that? Yeah, well, I, I think, see, content is an evolving thing in the sense, when, when you create a platform, you need the ability to bring in content onto the platform. That content could be, uh, you know, textbook content, teacher-generated content, market content, you know, open stuff on YouTube, whatever. And, and then, over time, that will get better because one of the things with the digital platform is you can put a high level of telemetry or measurement. And very easily, you will have data on which content is popular, which content is easy to use, which content is hard to use, and so on. And I think over time, the curation process will get the content to keep improving. So rather than think of content as a point solution, I would think of it as a continuum where you keep improving it over time. And that's, you can get that with digital. The beauty of digital is that you get telemetry, you get data on performance, usage, uh, ease of use, and then you use that data to make things better. In fact, one of the diagnostic tools that the uh, team has developed is precisely uh, difficulty of words. At what, w and it has a metric for difficulty of words and a, 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 what is that called, the, the word net to allow you to replace a, a difficult word with a less difficult word without changing the meaning. So th there are lots of tools. I described only one. But when, as people start to use these, some of those problems could be solved. Yeah. I understand, uh, but government teachers will also be on this so platform. So the platform is a little bit like, you know, I never knew there was so much talent in India for singing. After Saragama? Yeah, exactly right. It's amazing how exactly right. the best just pops up to the top, right? Yeah, so exactly It's a little right. bit like that. Yeah, so for example, you could have star teachers who get star content, and then the data will show that their content is more popular. It's already happening. The Maharashtra school teachers, they're developing better and better content on this platform. The government teachers. Yeah. Uh, this is a question related to that. Uh, who is kind of accountable for the content? So as compared to a Baiju's, uh, how does this, uh, how do we ensure that the content is pristine? So uh, that, that's a real problem. What do you mean front end is? Meaning? No, content is pristine. Yeah, so uh, in these cases, the states have a curation uh, committee which uh, validates the content before it's put on their platform. So because it's, it's, it's for children, I don't think yeah, you can it's, avoid it's, com moderation it's, of it's some not, kind. It's not, it's curated content by the states in this case. So, so kind of who's, uh, this, this is an open source movement and who... No, no, the, the source code is open source GitHub kind of thing. The content, at least the content that is being provided by many people is Creative Commons, which means they can use it without any IP issues. <laughs> but when it's user-generated content in the sense that, let's say, the a particular state government is generating content, then they have a curation and process to make sure the content that's going on the platform is, is clean. Today, the problem is that the content, to a large extent, is irrelevant in the existing education system. So that's, that's the reason you have somebody like a Baiju coming up. So uh, I, was, uh, I was curious to know, how do you ensure, now that we have open source platform, it's a very, very good thing to have. How do we ensure that the content is pristine, good, so that uh, this is more effective? Yeah, as I said, no, that once you start using it and content will pass the test of quality, whether it's used proper, used or not. I mean, data will tell us how to improve the content, as opposed to my view or somebody else's view. Data will help us to improve content. So we have about 10 minutes left, so let's sh shift the discussion from just education to other topics. Yes. My, so, my, yeah. My name is uh, Giri, and my company Ideas to Impacts is a proud uh, partner for XTEP for content curation. And we do it in multiple languages from our small town model at Ideas to Impacts. That's our company. <laughs> my question to you, Nandan, is uh, one of the big inspirations that you have provided to all of us is that 
as a co-founder of Infosys, it would have been very hard to imagine that a person like you would be known for, or any co-founder of Infosys would be known for anything else. And not only have you done that, you're more known for Aadhaar now than for uh, even Infosys. And so for a guy like me who's getting into his second innings, uh, it's a very, uh, I have your advice on what you had to unlearn, what you had to learn you to get into this second innings and make it even more successful than the first innings. Well, I mean, I think if you get into your second innings, you have to act like you're starting for the first time. You know, so you, you cannot ride on your laurels saying, okay, I did this previous achievement, so you guys have to treat me like somebody. You have to go back to basics and say, okay, I'm learning the ropes all over again. It's a startup all over again. I have to prove myself all over again. So I think going with that, you know, back to, back to the basics is very important. A lot of people, second Ram, innings, they try to build on their first innings. is currently restricted to education, but given that we have a lot more problems to solve, is there any way that that platform can be used for other solutions? Is it only restricted only to education? No, no. In fact, as I said, societal platforms is a approach to problem solving. Education is one instance of that. And currently, it's being looked at by a global telementoring healthcare group to, because they want to create a global network of Health, uh, upgrading healthcare professionals to provide, and it's being looked at by a global livelihood group, which is implementing a livelihood program. Uh, so it's actually, and there's a- At Algium, which is the foundation I set up for water and sanitation, Algium's version 4.0 will be using the idea of societal platforms to look at both groundwater and water quality across the country. Yeah, so the idea is not education. Education is just one instance where we are proving the ideas that we are going to abstract out. So, so Rohini, can you talk a little bit about water? I know you have a lot of background in it. Yeah, uh, since we don't have much time, let me just say that uh, I'm very happy to see all the work you all have done on water. I think water is going to be one of the most severe crises in the country that is we are very underprepared for and climate change is already upon us. Um, one of the structural issues on water in India is much of public funds have been deployed towards building out our surface water infrastructure. 400,000 crores was the number some time ago. However, India uses groundwater. While the surface water uh, structures are in place, 80% of drinking water in this country comes from the ground. 60 to 70% of irrigation water comes from the ground, despite the massive irrigation infrastructure. And India has the most unregulated groundwater economy in the world and the highest extraction of groundwater in the world. So this is going to create problems. You are actually seeing uh, surface water, groundwater is connected, and we are actually seeing impact on rivers from the pulling out of groundwater in an absolutely unsustainable way. So the real big challenge for all of us is to look at sustainable use of groundwater and a change in policy to regulate it much better. But we have 30 million mostly private groundwater extracting wells. And how to do that is one of the most tricky policy and behavior issues in the world. Algium is trying to work on that now through a societal platform lens so that all three entities, Samaj Bazar Sarkar, can come onto it. But that's just one of the things that bothers us and we are working on, along with truly frightening emerging issues of, uh, of um, water quality all over the country. And the sanitation, building only toilets, is adding to this because the groundwater is getting impacted from the rapid building of just toilets. So waste stream management is again going to become the biggest thing. Any solutions in your sandbox that are looking not just at providing the water, but at managing the waste streams is going to make the difference. So which, which country does it best? You know, every country is facing new problems. You know what's happening in Cape Town. They're calling it day zero. And on April 22nd, they're going to officially say there's no more water left in Cape Town. Oh. They're going to have to call in the army. And this is just the beginning of what's going to happen. America used to manage it rather well. But then, it's, you know what's happening in California. You know what's happening in other places. I think we need a rethink. We have to move to thinking about water like we had started to think recently about energy, decentralized, uh, small, flexible, resilient, but with a big data uh, and uh, systems uh, backend, we have to rethink water globally. Do, do we have a good map of where the water is in India? 
Uh, so that's one of the things we're going to do on groundwater. The government is trying to make a national aquifer map uh, from, with, from top down. Some of us are working from below so that there is granular information on groundwater. Uh, water is a state subject. States don't want to share data on water. And that's become a huge problem. Right. Hello, yeah. I have a question. I'm Saumya from the Takshashila Institution. Uh, more so in terms of uh, the societal platform. While a lot of digitization is happening, how intuitive or user-friendly the feedback loop for the entire system is getting built on? And uh, does it also enable uh, customization and uh, uh, you know, uh, simplifying of things rather than make it uh, more complex. So if you can give me some insights on that. Yeah, I, I think uh, our effort is to make sure that where these platforms touch users, that interface is as simple, as intuitive as possible. And the complexity and sophistication is behind the, behind the, I mean, it's like a Google search. All you get is a Google box and you enter the thing. You don't know what's happening behind some complex page rank algorithm and all that happening. So I think that's how we think about it. Make it simple to the user, but you know, sort of put the complexity and sophistication below the hood. And uh, we're also building open data tools on top of this. So data telemetry will be exposed, available for researchers, uh, and, and making it an open data platform. And of course, for, for the purposes, in, uh, 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 for the learning thing, we're also looking at how the data can be used to, cust to personalize the learning and allow machine learning and all to really give targeted uh, inputs to each person using the platform. It's an important question, and I've seen how much time the team puts into this. Because at the end of it, who's going to use it? Ordinary people like me who don't understand technology. And they spend a lot of time on, on the front-facing design. Groundwater, you already hinted it, we need a groundwater mapping by natural isotope technique. Groundwater streams are in tens and thousands of numbers than surface water. You need a proper mapping of that. Isotope technique is the natural one, easy one. And we have the manpower also that the Survey of India can do the survey of groundwater also. Why not? Lots of men are there. There, if I want water here, I need not to worry here. I know this water comes from which part of the upper hills. There I replenish it. I store there. There it could be a forest or a land which is less fertile. But I store water there, I get the water here. So this mapping and planning could be done and you have manpower the form of survey of India, ma man, madam. Thank you. But yeah. sometimes, uh, Desh, data is not value neutral, right? Who has that control of that data and whether equity and sustainability can result from just data, it's a political economy question. And it's not, in water especially, it's not just about knowing where the water is, but who's going to be able to access it. And that depends on power structures. And actually, the real work of civil society is in that domain, in my opinion, when it comes to natural resources like water. And finite natural resources like water, especially. Yes, yes. No, I'm not, I'm not making a critique of what you said. I said it's very important to have the data, but for me, the most exciting, the most uh, important issues are in the political economy space. But thank you for that. Uh, uh, with due respect to all the power pack people sitting there, um, just wanted to know, when I'm seeing last two days here, there's so much of um, um, intention and desire to make a difference to very many fields from philanthropic minds here. I'm just worried and concerned that in isolation, many of the people are working in different fields. Just to make the impact bigger, uh, I'm just wondering what could be a better platform? Because there are so many fields, right? Where education, alternate energy, um, health. And uh, I hear a lot of people working excellent uh, way. But I'm just wondering what would be the right way to put them together to get the benefit out of this whole work. So and Rohini, Deshpande that's Foundation. What Desh is, you know, you, you, you that's see what Desh a is lot doing. of people, but the societal platform will, is one way to bring people yeah. together. But what are the other emotional ways? What are the other, you know, it, this is very much like entrepreneurs who start up a, a new thing. 
Whenever there's a new company, you want to compete. You want to take a lot of pride in why you are better than anybody else. And that happens 100 times more in the nonprofit sector. Because being a founder in the nonprofit sector is harder than being an entrepreneur in the for-profit sector. Because the resources are very limited. The amount of sacrifice that you make is huge. So the pride and, and the belief that what you're doing is the best and the greatest is what sort of pushes you forward. How do we, how do we bring them all together? Yeah, I think, you know, it's a very good question, and I don't think anyone has perfect answers, so let me not claim to have any. But I think the seeds still remain in what we have been talking about. If you can create uh, uh, that shared infrastructure, for example, in Pratham Books, right, the reason we said we want to impact on the publishing industry, it's not just about Pratham Books. We want to make sure that everybody in that sector is interesting in get, interesting, interested in getting more books to more kids in more languages. So what we developed was a platform on which everybody could operate. So whether it's even Tulika Books, which is a for-profit entity that has to compete with Pratham Books, even they were able to uh, discover more of the market because of what we did. And I think so if philanthropic capital is used to do this, because philanthropic capital is not competitive, hopefully, uh, but it should allow competition to play on top of it. And, yeah. and that's how you can get more than the sum of the parts. Yeah, my, my also, uh, sorry. Yeah, my my intention is not actually to uh, hold you as responsible to answer this, but being thought leaders, you three and some people here can think of, uh, you know, putting domain specific philanthropic workshops together. For example, Deshpande Foundation, like a development dialogue for yeah. a particular region, because I'm assuming that there are a lot more people working on very many across the which, country. Which sector do you work in? Healthcare. Healthcare. So, yeah, Neelam, you, you know Neelam, right? Neelam yes. Maheshwari? Yeah. So, Neelam runs our grants program. Yeah. So, she started this program about five years ago, where every quarter, so because this is like such a large crowd, yeah. it's very hard to do anything really true, meaningful. True, true. So, every quarter, she has a meeting for health, education, livelihood, and agriculture. Okay. Typically, it's maybe 20 partners who come together. And what we found initially was very hard to sort of run them like board meetings where you hold people responsible. But Neelam has been very successful in making each one of them uh, sort of make commitments to that meeting and it's their peers. At the next meeting they say, hey, last time you said you're gonna do this, what have you done? So there is, you know, but this is a very small effort. Yeah. But I think we need to create more of those platforms where uh, all of I you come together yeah. there and, are and, and share your can... best practices and, and also hold each other responsible Co for co what you work want. to get the impact better. Yeah. So the India Philanthropy Initiative, which was started about five years ago and brings many givers of India together, we hold about three or four or at least four uh, thematics every uh, year on different domains and invite all those who have done work on it to shed light on that topic so that more Indian philanthropic capital can be pushed into that pipeline. And we intend to do a lot more. There are other things like the Edel Give platform, which does these kind of meetings every quarter in one domain. So what you're saying is happening. I hope you can tap into some of it. Yeah, I think this will benefit Thank you. many other people who are working and then trying to work together. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. But also, you know, I think when you bring people together, they have to be more or less of similar size. You know, it's like a bringing a very big company with a startup, and then that doesn't work. So, and, and there's hundreds of them, 1.4 million NGOs in, in India. Even if 10% of them or 5% of them are useful, it's still thousands. So we need a lot of sort of local get-togethers for them to come together and share the best practices and so on. So, you know, I think, I think this, this platform, uh, Nandan comes from a culture, like he said yesterday, where it's always under promise, over deliver. So I think we can take his word for what he's saying, that this platform is gonna work. And <laughs> Roini is still crossing her fingers, but Nandan, you're gonna deliver, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, good. So next, next DD, they'll both come and, and show us what they've done. And, and you can be the judges. Thank you. So.